You look like you're up to no good right there. <laughs> How am I going to make the bed with you laying there like that? I know one surefire way of getting you up. How about if I told you I was going to take you to Silver Lake Park? Would that get you up? Silver Lake Park? Okie dokie. It did rain here quite a bit yesterday, so I have no idea what we're going to be showing up to. If it's going to be a mud pit or what. I'm hoping not. I hope it dried out by now. Lots of people out and about today. I was mentioning the other day we've never taken this since they opened it up. This pathway along the reservoir, so we're going to do it today. Pretty cool view. Let's get back on the trail. My thought with coming here is that if the park is too muddy, we could at least walk around the reservoir. So that's probably what we'll end up doing. I can see the park from here. See that right there is his park. There's not one dog there. Then over at the bigger park right next to it, like one dog maybe, two. You'll enjoy the hike, won't you, Jaw? We got some helicopter action. Probably a perfect time for me to break in my shoes today, too. If you were looking for a way to be cool, here you go. Leftover Christmas tree. Rest in peace, 2018. Well, today I decided to bring us out to Hollywood Forever and talk about and visit someone who has a very interesting history for what she's remembered for, Miss Marion Davies. You see, Marion Davies had a 20 year acting career, but she almost only goes down as being remembered as the mistress to William Randolph Hearst Newspaper mogul. Now this was an almost 35 year affair that everyone knew about. Um, it didn't end until William Randolph Hearst died. And in fact, in 1937, when uh, Marion Davis called it an end to her career, she retired. She said that it was to basically be a companion for William Randolph Hearst. And to her credit, when William Randolph Hearst was almost at bankruptcy, she loaned him a million dollars. And in return, when he passed away, she was granted 200,000 shares of stock in Hearst Corporations, leaving her as the majority stockholder. Now, if we take this walkway straight through here, onto this little bridge out here, we can see her tomb across the lake. Then we'll walk over to it. No, this monstrous monument here is not hers. But that one is right there. The one that says Doras, D-O-U-R-A-S. That was her original name. Her and her sisters changed their name when they were very young to Davies, and I'll tell you why. Johnny Ramone's memorial. And here's the tomb for Anton Yelchin. And we're heading right over here. Here's the Davies family tomb. Now, the way that her name became Davies is because when she was a kid, this was a, as she said, a foreigner's last name. And so her and her sisters knew that um, to ever be taken seriously, it helped to have an English last name. Well, they saw a realtor in their neighborhood of Brooklyn with signs out. His last name was Davies and they figured out that this was Welsh. So they adopted this as all of their last names. Now she got her start on Broadway, um, doing some productions as well as being a Ziegfeld girl 
And William Randolph Hearst saw her in 1917, 1918, and immediately fell in love with her right away and basically made her his. She um, allowed him to take over managing her career. Some say this was a double-edged sword because some say that that was an unfair advantage that she had and a lot of people that worked with her knew her talent said, no, this actually hindered her because William Randolph Hearst only wanted her to do period pieces with extravagant uh, period piece gowns and people that knew her said she wasn't really that good at that. Um, she got her start in the silent film era and she um, basically, you know, thanks to him, anything that she was in, he financed it and promoted the living bejesus out of it to make her a star. So as soon as she started making movies, she became a box office sensation and um, was never anything but top billing her entire career. And so, 1924, she was voted by the movie theater owners as the number one female draw. Now, where um, she got a little scared was when the talking pictures came in because she had had a kind of a stutter her whole life that she'd never been able to get rid of and was worried this would come out in these new pictures, but it actually didn't. She did very well for herself. Um, going on to star in movies with Gary Cooper, Clark Gable, and like I said, she was always the star. But people that knew her from the Hearst Davies parties that they would throw said she was just the life of the party. And so they realized that really her strength was doing comedy. And so um, once she could kind of get King Vidor and people like that, directors to um, see her as that, and get William Randolph Hearst to basically allow her to do those kind of things, she really became a star in her own right, even though, as I said, because of Citizen Kane, now she's almost looked at as um, someone who had no talent, which was you know, pretty much just the opposite. She was very talented. Um, she wrote a lot of the things that she was in. She was a philanthropist. She, like I said, um, in the end, got 200,000 shares of her stock but she only kept 30,000 of it and ended up uh, donating the rest of it back to the Hearst Corporation. So she wasn't in it only for the money, as well as, like I said, when his company came into almost bankruptcy to save face, she donated a million dollars or loaned it to him. And what she said was she said, her love with William Randolph Hearst was nothing out of the ordinary. It wasn't that he was, you know, um, very terribly interesting or if they had a lot in common or anything like that she said basically it just really came down to the fact that she said for as much as he had in his life she knew by the way he treated her that that she meant something to him and that countered anything else she said <laughs> kind of crassly that she could get a better lay any day of the week and find a better conversation any day of the week and many things that you know you might think would be the most important thing she said really it was just the fact that she knew that he truly did care for her now the reason they never ever got married was because um William Randolph Hearst just didn't his wife really wouldn't allow it she liked having the name of Hearst and um she got a really, really good sum of money to live off of during those times, and uh, she didn't want to give that up. Now, at one point, I guess William Randolph Hearst seriously considered marrying Marion Davies and was going to, and yet, once again, when he tried to negotiate with his wife, her asking price was far too high. Now, what's kind of sad is that he died in 1951, and basically what ended up happening was... Um, how her career kind of ended was that Irving Thalberg was giving his wife, Norma Shear, a lot of the great movie roles in that day. And, uh, and they were things that William Randolph first wanted Marion Davies to have. And so because uh, Norma Shear kept getting these parts, eventually William Randolph first quit uh, running advertisement for anything MGM and started shopping her away from MGM trying to get... Um, code deals because he owned Cosmopolitan Pictures, which is basically who put out everything that Marion Davies did. He was trying to find code deals with Paramount to do co-productions. And by that time she was getting older, it was like 1937, and she was kind of humoring the idea of playing some um, supporting roles, but William Randolph first said, no, you'll ruin your entire history, your entire career if you do that. So she never really did it and stepped away from the screen. Now once he passed away, 
within 11 weeks, almost to the day of William Randolph Hearst passing away, she married someone. And she said it was a horrible marriage, but she said even though he was abusive and treated her really poorly, she said basically that he always, in the end, would say he needed her. And that's what kept her around, which was kind of sad. Now, according to history, Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst never had any children together. But it's come out in years since that they did. They had a secret daughter in 1923, and she is known as Patricia Lake. And what they said happened was that Marion Davies got pregnant, and William Randolph Hearst sent her over to London, or sent her to England, to have the baby, or at least while she was pregnant, sent her off to Europe. And, um, and then once she had the baby, Mary and Davy's sister, Rosemary, had lost her baby um, at, when she was a baby, and her name was Rose. So they just gave uh, Patricia to Rosemary, and she ended up raising um, Patricia as Rose. And then she said when she was 11 years old, um, her mother and father, Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst, came clean and told her that they were her parents and even gave her away at her wedding when she was 17. And she said that they never really made this a public announcement or anything. Just the fact that she was told by both of them was enough for her. She said she never needed any kind of uh, public announcement. But like I said, Marion Davies had a uh, pretty much a 20 year career and they said when you go back and look at the box office numbers and everything when it's all said and done everything that she did was profitable so to sum her up as just being this talentless woman who got lucky by meeting William Randolph Hearst it's not true it's really just that you know that um, he took a liking to her and she liked him because she wanted someone to need her and that was just their relationship pretty much throughout their entire life. And she ended up donating a lot of money. I mean, we're talking like $2 million to um, different uh, cancer research foundations and had, had had buildings named after her. And then while she was alive, gave away the name of the building, like um, would give it and let somebody else have it named after them. She just didn't need the acclaim. One of the interesting things they said that early on turned people off of her was that William Randolph Hearst in 1929, um, in the height of the, you know, the Great Depression had made people poor, he went and bought a theater in San Francisco and um, completely redid it in like rosebud vinyl and just made this like a top of the line theater and then renamed it the Marion Davies Theater and a lot of people thought that she hadn't done en enough in her life to have a theater named after her, and they said when he, what he loved about it was that he could look and sit in his office in San Francisco and look out the window at night and see her name lit up in red and lights, and so that turned a lot of people off. But like I said, once she started throwing all the parties and and everything, and, and even if um, Mrs. Hurst wanted to come and stay at San Simeon or one of their numerous properties, and Marion Davies was there. Um, Generally, what would happen was that Marion Davies would either take off or they would separate the party. Like, uh, Mrs. Hurst would be in attendance for one part of the party, but then the other part of the party would be Marion Davies because she was the life of the party. Marion Davies passed away with a $20 million estimated estate, and at her funeral, when she passed away from stomach cancer, in attendance were Mary Pickford, John Weismuller, and Mrs. Clark Gable. Now years later Orson Welles would tell director Peter Bogdanovich that um, Citizen Kane was never about William Randolph Hearst or Marion Davies. He said Marion Davies was actually a very talented woman and he said that the inspirations came from Samuel Insull building a Chicago Opera House and business tycoon Harold Fowler McCormick um, promoting the opera career of his second, second wife. He said that's directly what, what it was that um, inspired Citizen Kane. And right directly next to Marion Davies right here is actor Tyrone Power. By all accounts from everything I've read, I have never seen anyone mention um, a foul word about Marion Davies or any actors from that time even saying they didn't like her. 
if anything, everyone said that she was a joy to be around, and like I said, she was always the life of the Hearst parties. And here's Chris Cornell on our way out. Now, if you're curious as to where Marion Davies lived, go look up on my channel, Hearst Castle. I've done about three or four different vlogs from there, including one at night where they had people dressed as staff members. Well, I feel like we should head out of here now. Well, I'm pretty sure they're done filming, but Tarantino didn't tear down the Aquarius stuff yet, so that's pretty cool. Well, I guess we're gonna call it a night. Thank you Duncan Burrell and Ken Jackson for making contributions to my channel. And I tried to swing by the grocery store, but um, there were like eight cop cars out front and the only entrance and exit to the place was being blocked by the person they were apprehending. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll hear about that on the news tomorrow. Come back and see me tomorrow. I know exactly what I'm going to do tomorrow for the vlog. I was reading about this guy who they say inspired James Brown, Bob Dylan, and Muhammad Ali. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good night.